Hello, I'm Professor Patrick McGorry. Welcome to today's webinar. Before we proceed, as Executive Director of Origin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work around Australia and pay my respects to Elders both past and present. Hi and welcome to today's webinar presented by Origin, the National Centre for Excellence in Youth Mental Health. I'm your youth convener for today. My name's Bree. I'm a social work and psychology student and I'm completing my social work honours at RMIT this year and I was a summer intern with Origin in 2017. Uh, I've got an interest in working in the mental health sector so I've really enjoyed being a part of this project and um, the development of this webinar. Today's topic uh, is going to be giving a snapshot of a recently published trauma and young people policy report. It was developed in partnership with Origin and Phoenix Australia, the Centre for Post-Traumatic um, Mental Health. And today's presenter will be Dr Sarah Bendel, and she's a senior research fellow at Origin. She's also a clinical psychologist at Headspace and has practised as a psychologist for over 20 years. Sarah works on psychological interventions for young people with complex mental health needs, and her research aims to improve the experiences of young people who have experienced trauma. So Sarah, we didn't have time to cover the whole report today because it's quite com comprehensive, but what are some of the key insights that you're going to share with us? Thanks heaps, Bree. Um, well, you're absolutely right. It's a it's a big it's a big report. So what we decided we'd do um, in in on this web webinar today mm -hmm. was to really um, jump in and have an in depth look at two areas of the report, and those are trauma in informed care in youth mental health settings and disclosure and trauma assessments. And what we really wanted to do was um, really provide um, youth mental health um, service providers with a kind of close in perspective on these two issues because they're, they're two that are really um, central to service delivery and they also I think are things that we don't necessarily know heaps about or we don't quite know how to do. So this, um, so this webinar is not necessarily about um, helping um, service providers to do trauma-informed care or to do assessment, um, but what we're really doing is taking a much more of an overview perspective on um, what the where, where are the policy, uh, where are the gaps in these things and what the policy issues should be. So much more focus on policy than clinical practice, but as you'll be telling um, clinicians at the end, we do have a lot of other resources that are much more focused on um, on how the, the nuts and bolts, the how of, yeah. of these things. This one's a lot more high level. Mm -hmm. So what we're really trying to do is um, link the um, the challenges um, that are that that we face, um, that we as clinicians face in this space with, with policy. Yeah. Uh, and that's really what the policy report was all about, was um, was uh, realising that lots of the issues in, um, in trauma and youth mental health need to be addressed at a policy level as well as at a kind of practice level. Yeah. So let's get on with it. <laughs> so, um, so this is the um, the policy, the cover of our policy document that's on the website now. So please, um, please go to the website and have a look at the um, policy. It's pretty big. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're doing um, we're doing today is trying to kind of give you a really sort of condensed version of it um, that you can watch and don't have to read through. <laughs> So, so I'm not going to talk in detail about everything we know about the hows and whys of trauma in, impacting young people, but just enough really to give you a flavour of how we conceptualise the impact of trauma in the policy paper. So as I said, go to the policy paper if you'd like to know more about this kind of issue and there's lots of other resources that we'll point you to. So first of all, what is trauma? So the way that we conceptualise trauma it's a complex. It's a, it's a complex question, but the, the way we conceptualised it in um, in this policy document 
was really we, we categorized it into four, um, four different um, ideas. So the first one is single incident trauma or type one trauma. And so this is, um, this is a trauma that's unexpected or out of the blue, like a natural disaster or an accident or a terrorist attack um, or an, an assault. The second type is, um, is what we call complex trauma or type 2 trauma. And this is where um, young people and children in particular might have prolonged or repeated traumatic events that um, often begin, they can begin quite early in childhood and um, they can extend over a long period of time. So um, these events or experiences are often interpersonal like and they're they can be things like neglect or physical or sexual abuse. And then the third kind of trauma is, is very important um, in this, when we're talking about this webinar, and that's secondary trauma. And that's hearing firsthand about the traumatic ex experiences of another person. And professionals working with traumatized populations experience secondary trauma a lot and don't necessarily know that they're doing that. Um, the fourth is, um, is intergenerational trauma. So this is trauma that's experienced in parents' lives, then being passed down to children and is most important in, um, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people, as well as um, refugees. So I'm going to give you some really sort of high level statistics here. Um, and hopefully pretty briefly. So about 75% of Australians will experience a potentially or tra traumatic event sometime in their life. Five to 10% um, percent of Australians will experience post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD um, at some point in their lives. Two thirds of young people um, will be exposed to at least one traumatic event by the age of 16. And one in six young people will develop PTSD after a traumatic um, experience. Um, and most of them, um, but that, will, that will happen for young women more than young men. Now, it's really important to remember that traumatic experiences can affect people in different ways, depending on the nature of the trauma and lots of other factors that are going on in a person's life. So this diagram that you can see here shows um, that um, was actually developed by our partner Phoenix Australia, um, shows some broad um, categories of the ways that people can, um, that can, can be affected by trauma. So you can see on the top yellow line that some people can be resilient to trauma and it can have very little effect on them. Others can experience recovery where they can be deeply affected in a variety of ways, but then be able to leave a lot of the ne negative impacts of the trauma behind and live pretty full lives. Another important group are those who show few or no effects of trauma at the time, but then after the trauma, they can become quite um, affected by the trauma. Um, and that often happens when they've experienced a trigger. So one example of this is um, a, a, a woman who may have been sexually abused as a child and then um, has a baby. And that triggers for a variety of reasons the memories, the, the, the major memories of the trauma and the distress that um, is associated with that. And then the last, um, the last kind of trajectory on this, on this diagram is, is the, the people who have persistent um, impairment of their function, functioning as a result of trauma. So again, this is another slide that we just, we're just wanting to give you a really big picture of um, the impact of trauma on children and young people. So um, one thing that, we've just, well, that we now know and from research over the last 10 years is that trauma impacts the developing brain of, of children and young people in a variety of ways. Um, so it can actually have a direct um, neural impact um, we also know that, um, that traumas, they have impacts on mental health, but they also have impacts on physical health to the point that we know that if, if people have experienced, children have experienced six or more adverse childhood experiences, 
then they have a 20-year reduction in lifespan compared to those who haven't experienced those, um, those difficult um, problems. Um, we also know that young people with trauma histories are significantly more likely to have a parent with a history of trauma. So one of the things that we that, that's very important and that is highlighted in our policy piece is that trauma, the, the effects of trauma in terms of mental ill health are more than just PTSD. So young people who have experienced trauma also they can develop depression, anxiety, psychosis, personality disorders, eating disorders, they can have alcohol and drug problems, they can get a variety of different kinds of mental um, health problems and often a um, uh, more than one of those and a, and a complex and often a very complex um, presentation of lots of different mental health problems. So that's the kind of background. Um, and now I wanted to talk to you about the way we developed our, um, our policy document, our policy report. Um, we did a lot of research um, on the literature around trauma and youth mental health. And we also consulted with Australian trauma and youth mental health experts. And we did that via internet surveys and um, a consultation round, round table um, last year. And one of the most important things that came up in both um, those um, searches was the concept of trauma-informed care. So this is a um, quote from a service provider that um, came up during those consultations. So trauma-informed service has a strengths-based framework that is grounded in an understanding of and responsiveness to the impact of trauma that emphasises physical, psychological and emotional safety for both providers and children and young people, and that creates opportunities for them to rebuild a sense of control and empowerment. So the reason that we showed you that, that quote is because it really beautifully encapsulates what trauma-informed care is. Um, and, um, and I think the most important kind of overall concept of what trauma-informed care is, is the idea that it, um, it provides a treatment environment or it's a service delivery model that takes account of the specific needs and sensitivities of those who experience trauma. But it's not designed um, to specifically treat or, um, or um, help um, to target the, the symptoms that are related to trauma exposure. So it's not a specific treatment approach. So we looked carefully at the research um, that, that, that's been done on trauma-informed care in young people, and we found some strengths, but we found some, some real gaps as well. And the strengths were um, that the knowledge and usage of trauma-informed care has really um, grown massively in the last few years. So this idea of trauma-informed care has gained great currency. People understand that they get it. Um, so that's a really fantastic thing. Um, and we've also found that um, practitioners who are trained in trauma-informed care um, feel like they've um, gained knowledge and skills from those trainings. There are some gaps in the published literature, one of them being that um, when the quality of those studies is um, it was variable and is also quite unclear. And that no study has actually evaluated whether trauma-informed care leads to um, young people having a different experience of treatment. So we know it's supposed to do that, but we don't know if it actually does that because there hasn't been, those pieces of research haven't been done. We also, in, in scoping the policy um, on trauma-informed care in Australia, we found um, another suite of gaps. Um, and these were um, that there was a lack, um, particularly in mental health care policies, of the relationship, there was a lack of acknowledgement of that relationship between trauma and poor mental health outcomes. And that then impacted 
um, the fact that there wasn't much um, there wasn't much commentary on trauma informed services or system design, particularly in mental health policies. Um, there was a lack of consistent um, national guidance around what the definition of trauma informed care was. So we still don't really have an absolutely clear definition of what it means. Um, there was a, a lack of widespread um, training for staff in youth mental health services um, for trauma-informed care and a lot of inconsistency in the implementation um, of trauma-informed care and a lack of understanding of a, and um, sense of whether um, there was much fidelity to the implement, implementation if it happened. And this really is um, because there is partly because the, the definition is unclear. So there's another quote here from a service provider that was about um, reflection of whether trauma-informed care is actually enough. Questions about trauma exposure are not routinely asked at intake. Youth will often progress through the mental health system without their trauma events being acknowledged and as a result can be misdiagnosed and inappropriately treated. So this this quote really was um, was indicative of a lot of thing, a lot of um, what um, particularly the experts said around trauma informed care, and that was that yes, trauma informed care is really important, but there are other more specific and sort of much more operational um, things that need to be done in um, in mental health youth mental health settings, mm -hmm. and one of them is asking young people about trauma, so trauma assessments. So in the policy, we came up with this, um, this um, conceptualization of what should be done um, for really good quality um, addressing of trauma in a youth mental health service, and that is that a, a service should be trauma informed. Um, it, should, um, it should assess every young person who comes to the service um, for trauma and then there should be some kind of trauma treatment um, and hopefully that would be within the service it may be a referral to another service and what that trauma treatment might look like could be different um, in different settings but that the, the, these are the three components that we think are, are essential for the best quality trauma care. So the other um, way that we gained really important information um, for this policy report was that we looked at Australian internet forums where young people were talking to each other about their experiences of trauma. And what we found was that they often described not being able to being asked about trauma in youth mental health services and there were lots of other issues with disclosure and assessment. And um, so what that did is really spoke to um, what I've just said previously about how important trauma assessment is. So um, when we um, when we looked at these forums, we identified quite a few barriers to help seeking disclosure um, that young people talked about. So one of them was stigma and shame. So they felt very embarrassed and ashamed about what had happened to them. They also, um, it, there was a sense of a lack of trust of youth mental health services, a feeling that they might be misunderstood. And they, some of them described negative previous experiences when they tried to talk about trauma with professionals. Um, they also talked about normalization of trauma. So. Um, the idea that many other of their peers may have been traumatised in the same way and they couldn't really work out whether, whether what they had experienced was trauma or not. Mm, that's something that's come up within my peer groups, that idea that um, what you've experienced isn't bad enough or doesn't quite count towards trauma. Yeah, yeah, that's that, well, that's certainly my experience in my in my when I work clinically with young people too, um, and they and they and and what what I think is important about that is that as a clinician we we much more um, what we we don't we don't look at what the trauma is in terms yeah. of um, whether it meets some kind of criteria, and that's what that's what young people seem to feel like they 
have they have to meet some kind of criteria to make something a trauma, whereas w what we're looking at is um, is what they um, is the is the effect how how it's how it's impacting them, and that's what's most important. Yeah, yeah, and that kind of fits with another thing I'm seeing come up that you've got listed there is that idea of um, like what's wrong with you versus what's happened to you, and feeling like you might be pathologized. Yeah, yeah. So and I, and I I talk to young people about that too about the fact that they feel like the reason they're coming, the, what's going on inside them is because of the trauma, not because yeah. of them. Um, and sometimes if you don't know the trauma's there, then then as a clinician, then you can't you can't have that conceptualization. So yeah. it's also something that came up in our um, when we were looking at our um, what was what young people were talking about on the internet forums. Yeah. Yeah. And they also talked about um, about structural mm -hmm. issues too that are really important and very very important for our policy work and and these were that they couldn't afford to get private um, therapy for trauma they if they were sometimes placed on long waiting lists um, sometimes they just weren't there weren't services available to them at all um, and that they um, they sometimes they talked about um, being able to access the 10 Medicare-funded um, psychological sessions per year, but then they couldn't um, access services after that. So we also, um, in, our, um, in our talking to youth mental health experts, um, discovered a lot of barriers to trauma inquiries, um, some of which really mimic exactly what young people were talking about. So... Um, so one of the things that um, clinicians talked about was that they saw trauma and mental health issues as distinct and that needed to be responded to separately. So for some youth mental health clinicians, they felt like dealing with trauma was actually beyond their remit. Um, they also worried that asking about trauma could re-traumatise or trigger psychological distress they were worried about opening a Pandora's box and not being able to deal with what was going on. And, and also they talked about structural issues um, and, and many of them talked about um, not knowing how to assess um, or having, having, not having had training in how to use assessment tools or how to assess well. Um, they also talked about feeling reluctant to inquire about experiences of trauma because they didn't have the capacity to respond therapeutically. Um, and they talked about effective trauma treatment not being able to be delivered in the time they had to see young people, whatever the service was that they, that they were um, involved in. So now we're gonna be moving to um, a short video presented by Vivian Brown. She's a principal advisor um, in government relations and policy at Origin. Viv has worked um, in policy development, project management and program delivery for over 15 years within state, local government and the community sector. Within Origin, Vivian has been responsible for developing a number of major policy reports and government briefings across a range of issues, including trauma in young people, self-harm, youth suicide prevention, university, student mental health and eating disorders. The Trauma and Young People Report has a particular purpose to inform and provide recommendations for key government decision makers and service planners across Australia on how we can improve our response to young people who have experiences or histories of trauma. The focus of this audience is very important. Policy drives service delivery, program development, investments, workforce development activities and research priorities. In regards to trauma, our policy review and feedback from key stakeholders would suggest to us that trauma is not reflected well in mental health policies at present. It's no coincidence then <clears throat> that people delivering services to young people are crying out for information, for direction, for resources and training so that they can better deliver trauma-informed service environments and feel more confident in asking and assessing for trauma histories. <laughs> 
One of the key recommendations from the report was to improve our response in policy and address this critical gap. It is crucial that trauma is better reflected in mental health policies and strategies, but this requires much more than an overall statement recognising that trauma and adverse experiences impact mental health. It requires policy implementation plans to describe the actions, activities and funding to support services to deliver appropriate responses and evidence-based treatment for trauma. A number of barriers have already been discussed through this presentation. Activities that could address them include improving trauma literacy amongst young people and their families so that they are equipped with the skills and the knowledge to safely disclose trauma histories. It also involves increasing the trauma literacy amongst youth mental health service providers so that they can support disclosure from their end and identify where further assessment of the impact of a trauma experience might be necessary so that they can deliver the best mental health care possible. Governments need to continue to direct and adequately fund trauma-informed services, but additional resources also need to be provided to evaluate trauma-informed care and build a better understanding of the strengths and the challenges in implementation and outcomes for young people. It also means that governments need to understand that trauma screening and assessment for young people needs to be better supported and facilitated. This would involve the development of a trauma screening and assessment tool specific for this age group of 12 to 25 year olds and clinically tested and validated for its utility. That is that it's not overly onerous for providers to deliver, that it doesn't re-traumatise and that it can provide clinicians with a clear indication of the severity of the trauma and the impact on presenting mental health issues. There is also a need to prioritise trauma training for staff. This includes advanced practice training which will provide greater trauma expertise within services and also provide staff with access to supervision and support to mitigate against experiences of vicarious trauma that's inherent to their roles. Finally, governments must focus on addressing one of the most significant barriers that young people and clinicians identify around delivering care and support for trauma. And that is that even if a trauma-related diagnosis is identified, there isn't enough sessions available through public mental health care to deliver the evidence-based dose and duration of treatment required. Why start when you can't see it through in 10 sessions? At least in primary mental health care, the Australian Government should be developing an innovative package of care that can deliver the number of sessions needed. For PTSD, that could be up to 16 sessions. For complex trauma experiences, it could be many more. We also understand that waiting for significant shifts in public policy and waiting for the investments to flow through even afterwards can feel disempowering if you're working today and tomorrow with traumatised young people. And the policy machine often feels quite far removed from your day-to-day -day work. But there are still things you can do. You can read through the key recommendations of this report. Where you support them, promote them to your professional networks, to your networks, or also within your own organisations, and seek opportunities to advocate for their uptake by engaging key government decision makers and service planners in your local area in conversations about what's needed. Keep an eye on opportunities to become involved in the development of future mental health policies at a government level. Governments will often go out with opportunities for services and key stakeholders to provide input into the development of their policies. Or they even sometimes send out draft policies for consultation. So keep an eye out for when these opportunities occur, both as an individual, either as a young person or as a service provider, or look out for opportunities for your organisation to coordinate a response. And finally, you can participate in the policy work of other organisations that are pushing for this issue and providing advice to government. This includes Origin and Phoenix, but other organisations like Blue Knot and the Mental Health Coordinating Council of New South Wales have also been advocating for change on this issue, both at a national and a state and territory government level. Get on their mailing lists or make contact to find out how you can support them. These organisations will be doing a lot of work in the policy and data analysis and in reviewing the evidence base so they can provide the best possible recommendations and advice to government.
providing first-hand accounts at a service level or as a young person on what this particularly means to them and what the issues are for you in the field can provide particular potency to this call for action. And the more voices that are represented, the more undeniable it will be for government for the need for change and action. Thanks. So thanks for that, Viv. That gave us some insights into the sort of policy implications um, for current practice in this space. Um, Sarah, when we were preparing for this, you talked about some of the insights that you gained as a clinician um, working within policy. Are you able to share some of those now? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, it's what I what I found so interesting about working with Viv on this this report is that it made me realise how much my work, um, my face-to-face -face work with young people is really, um, can be constrained or enabled um, according to the policies that are behind um, a service. So, so I think what was really interesting in, in talking to all the, um, the, the service providers is, is they could talk about the issues that meant it was difficult to, to work with young people. It was hard to do good work with young people around trauma. Mm. And what this really made me realise is that it's because of there are all these policies or lack of policies around how we should be dealing with trauma. Mm. And so you kind of think it's a problem that's just of your service of yourself or of your service, but actually it's it goes way back, way back beyond beyond that to policy settings. Mm. And it really um, as Viv said in the in the video, it makes you realise that you need to be intervening not just at the kind of individual level, but also in terms of policy. Yeah. So it's been a great experience to see how policy really impacts on on my my um, service, my, the, the 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 therapy I give to young people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. As we were talking about, the video gave us some insight into um, the what what clinicians experience in terms of the policy implications, but um, also touched on um, what clinicians can do. And now we're just going into a little bit of the resources that are actually out there now for both serv service providers and for young people. So within the Origin website, um, there's a lot of information regarding trauma and young people and also where they can go for help. Um, Origin provides trauma-informed care online resources as well as face-to-face -face training for anyone working within the youth mental health services. Phoenix Australia, who partnered with, uh, with Origin for this report, um, you can visit their website and they've got a lot of trauma resources and training available for young people and practitioners. There's also the Blue Knot website and helpline and they provide information and short-term phone counselling for survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And there's also 1800 Respect, and they provide over the phone support for survivors of sexual assault, domestic, and family abuse. So that brings us to the end of our webinar. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you to Viv and also to Phoenix Australia. Um, this is part of a series of webinars, so please check out the Origin National Centre website for more resources that cover a range of topics around um, youth mental health. Thank you, and hope you've enjoyed it.